Hi, my name is Bill Carmody, and I'm the Marketing Whisperer. I am very pleased to have Jamie Stegmeyer here with me, who is the founder uh, and CEO of uh, Stonemeyer Games, and also as a publisher, uh, or actually the author of one of the best crowdfunding books that I've ever read. Hey, how are you doing, Jamie? Hey, Bill, thank you for having me. Thanks for your kind words. I'm, I'm glad you've enjoyed the book. Um, I, let me tell you, I want to just tell everybody that I have read several books on crowdfunding, and this is by far the most interesting as well as most informative. And what I mean specifically by that is, is that it really sort of helps you understand what crowdfunding is and what it is not. <laughs> so so thank, you for, thank you for putting it together. I really appreciate it. Yeah, it was my pleasure. So today, what I'd like to talk about is you, you have just a wealth of information. And one of the best things that I loved about your book sort of getting into it was that you don't need to start your, uh, your crowdfunding today. You know, like you, if someone handed you this book, you know, you shouldn't be rushing to the finish line. There's a lot of great things you, could, you should and can be doing. Um, but here's some great sort of checklists and uh, ideas before you actually go out there and launch your first Kickstarter campaign. And I think that goes for first-time creators and experienced creators. I, I'm paying attention to a, to a campaign right now where they intended to launch about a month ago, and they realized they weren't quite ready, and so they just they put it off for a month until they were ready. And now when they launch, they have a much higher chance of, of succeeding. Well, and, and that's just it. I think what you really did a great job of is really pulling together all of sort of the best cases and worst cases, and you did it in a very storytelling way, which I love. And so, I mean, one of the things that I would love to sort of dig into is, you know, you have sort of these top 10 lists, you know, and sort of thinking about sort of before you ever consider doing a crowdfunding, you know, pro project, here are 10 things you must do before you actually launch a, a, a project like that. Right. Yeah, there are some key things that I recommend to pretty much any creator. Um, one of them, should I just throw in a few? Yeah, examples? please, let's start. Yeah, so, so one thing that I, I recommend to anyone who's interested in, in someday being a crowdfunder or creator um, is to actually support and back some other crowdfunding campaigns. And this isn't a philanthropic measure, it's more uh, to get the experience of following these projects and right. learning from these other creators what, what's interesting to you that they've done, what's compelling to you as you get the updates, what's what's keeping you engaged what's versus what's turning you off. And those experiences I found have really added up both for me and for other creators to make, to make, to kind of increase their chances of success when they finally launch. Have you experienced that? Have you backed a bunch of projects on? on you know, it's, I'm, I am brand spanking new to crowdfunding. I have, I have followed the industry, you know, but for me, I really didn't have a good, clear, crisp reason of why I would use crowdfunding until I've read your book. And honestly, now I have all my, I, my, my head's exploding with sort of the, all the possibilities. And that's exactly, I'm following your book to the T and I'm exactly starting with funding and, and sort of participating in other people's projects. Because before I go launch my own, I definitely, I agree with you. You got to get in there and understand what these communities are all about and why why people fund in the first place totally yeah and kind of as you said there you can it's easy to go on kickstarter or indiegogo or any of these sites and read over the projects you can read through past updates you can read through all the contents you can learn a lot just from spending some time on the website yes well, and, and the other thing that I loved is is that in your arc, you know, you uh, with uh, Stonemeyer Games, you know, you really sort of talk about how you actually have applied each and every one of your principles to your own business, you know, and, and sort of, you know, really coming up with board games and really cool ideas and sort of really learning from your audience as to what they really want. I mean, to me, that's that's uh, that was a huge benefit, you know, based on the things you've done. Yeah, I kind of that hit me very early on in the process um, after I launched my first board game project, where I, I it kind of hit me that it wasn't really about me and what I wanted, even though I had a vision for my project. Um, but it was more about the, all these strangers around the world who were engaging with my project and what was interesting to them or what they wanted, and that uh, seeking to to add value to them became of utmost importance to me. And I think that really directed. Uh, the path of the project and the success of, of that, those early projects. So what else must someone do in order to have a successful uh, crowdfund? I think one of the, the biggest and most important things you can do um, that you almost need to do is you need to have built up um, some sort of uh, crowd in advance. You need yes. to go into the project already having um, exposed your project your, your, or your product, your idea to the world and to have people, to give people a, way, a centralized way to follow you, whether it's a a blog or a podcast or a Facebook page, you know, all these different ways that people can follow you and get enthusiastic about the thing that you're creating. Because one of the biggest 
ways to fail on Kickstarter is the opposite of that, where you show up, you launch a project, project where no one really knows about it at all, <laughs> And all of a sudden, you expect for people to just show up and find it. Well, or worse, you start spamming everybody. And he's like, hey, promote my my crowdfund. It's up and it's live. And you're like, I'm sorry, who are you? And what is this all about? And why should I care? You know? Right. We, we've all seen those Facebook posts or those Twitter posts of people saying, hey, you, you should back me. You should support me. And that's the first time you've ever heard of it. Um, yeah, that that that's that's a way to fail. <laughs> well, and and I love I love in your book what you talk about specifically is this idea of adding massive value from the blog community. And so so you start with backing other people's projects, then you sort of create your own blog, talking about what you're super passionate about, and people get to know you. And it's that point where you've already added massive value before you ever ask or even start a Kickstarter campaign or any type of crowdfund. You know, and I love that you've sort of you've demonstrated that you're fully committed to your your vision, your passion, and what you're all about. Yeah, that's. I think that's one of the best ways that you can gear up for a project, um, to start to build up that following, to show that you're, you're adding value to other people, and to learn how to interact with people online, um, you know, in the comment sections, because they're, hopefully if you have an active project, you're going to have a lot of comments from people who have questions about your project, um, who, who may doubt what you're doing, they, or they may be really enthusiastic about what you're doing, and managing and moderating all that. Um, is a skill that that um, many of us have just because we've been online for so long. But um, we, you know, when you're on Facebook just representing yourself, that's a lot different than when yes. you're representing a product or something that you're trying to create. Well, you know, and the other and the other part of that too is is that I think people originally, I mean, back in, in the early days of crowdfunding, people saw this as sort of the alternative to the bank. You know, I'm going to go out there and just basically raise a bunch of money. And so there was this cross between banking and sort of investor community, right? You know, in this sort of this weird hybrid place. But now I look at this as a way for entrepreneurs to save so much money and time by validating their assumptions. I mean, you think you got the greatest idea in the world. And of course, you talk to your mom and she thinks it's awesome. Go, 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 you know. But when tell you actually take it out to the real world and say, hey, does anyone like this idea? Is this something you guys would actually put dollars behind? There's a big difference between saying, you got a great idea, son, you should go for it. And another thing to say, I'll back you at even a dollar. You know what I mean? Like your idea has at least enough merit that I'll give you a buck. <laughs> So, yeah, the idea of gauging demand for what you're creating is, I, I believe, a huge part of what crowdfunding is. Um, whether it's just gauging demand, if there's enough good demand to make any of it, um, whether it's enough to make a minimum print run if you're, if you're producing something on scale, and if you do reach that funding goal where, with that minimum print run, if demand is way higher than you originally thought. And that way you're not just making 100 copies of something that 2,000 people want. Right. Crowdfunding can help you determine that demand up front. And therefore, you can sort of uh, act accordingly. I mean, there's, I think one of, the, one of the other great things about sort of the ideas of stretch goals is that you already say, look, let's plan for all three scenarios. Let's plan for if nobody wants our product. Okay, so there's the, how do we wrap that up quickly and sort of you know, go back to the drawing board? Let's plan if we hit success and basically the, 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 the project funds. Great. Let's plan for this is three or four times more successful than we ever anticipated. What would that look like? What more value could we provide to the audience? And to me, you're obsessed obsessed with that value and I love it because basically you're not focusing in on, well, how can I put more money in my pocket, which I think a lot of people might misconstrue in crowdfunding. It's no, no. How do I take the additional interest in my project and make the actual product that much more valuable? You know, that's great. Yeah. And I love that idea. Um, the, the flips, almost the dangerous side of that, um, that can happen sometimes is, some of the projects that wildly succeed, they, they wildly overfund and they have this, they start adding in all these stretch goals. They're engaging yeah. back, they're getting ideas from backers and they start throwing in more and more stuff. And then suddenly they realize they haven't budgeted for any of that stuff. Right. And that's where big projects can end up failing. Again, as you say, that's, that's a great way to look out for your backers to add so much value to them if, if you're making a lot more than you thought. But it's kind of that budget is one of those things that you need to, to really have a good grasp on if you want to successfully deliver on, on your promises. So, you know, one of the things that I want to make sure everybody who's watching this video knows is your blog, because what you did is you've, I, at the time of the writing and the publishing of your book, you had over 150 blog posts and, uh, and, uh, and they're all just really talking about sort of the pre, what to do before you crowdfund, what do you do during your crowdfunding, and then what do you do post? Because I think a lot of people think, well, I'm done, right? And there's all this other stuff that if you do it right, it sort of helps you set you up for the next crowdfund and really get the feedback that you need to be successful in crowdfunding. 
So please tell me a little bit, where, where do people go to find your blog? What are some of the things that they're gonna find there? Help, help make sure that everyone knows that this is a resource for them. Yeah, I've been, I've been writing this blog for about four years because I've been on Kickstarter for four years as a creator. Um, the blog is at uh, kickstarterlessons.com. Cool. Um, it applies to any crowdfunding platform and across any category of, of crowdfunding. I talk a lot about board games, but it, also, it applies to any category. Um, and this kind of stuff you find there is kind of similar to what you said. There are a bunch of Kickstarter lessons that, that are kind of step-by-step chronicle le- lessons about things to consider as you're putting together your project, as you're running it, as you're wrapping it up. Um, and then there are a bunch of top 10 lists. There are a bunch of guest posts and stories and highlights of other projects, like unique things that other projects are doing. Yes. Um, there's a lot of content there. And it's almost so much that you can get lost in it. And so it's one of those these things. We were talking about things that every creator should do. Um, I don't gain anything by someone reading my blog. So I'm not saying this just to, to make money or anything. But I really believe if someone reads, uh, if, if you think at some point in the future, six months, a year in the future, that you're thinking about running a project, go on the blog today and start reading a post or two. Yes. You don't have to read all 200 Kickstarter lessons on the first day because no one can, can absorb that much information. But to start slowly here and there, I think can, can go a long way. Well, you know, and that's, and I, I totally appreciate that. I think you, you have, you have looked at so many different angles. You know, what's great about it is, is that you've shared up front all the various different things that can either sort of trip you up or really make sure that you have a hugely successful campaign. And what I love about that is, is that those lessons learned sort of allow other people to sort of take what you've learned and make it that much better because now they can avoid all the mistakes you've already made or that you've already documented. And they can also draft off the success of all the campaigns that have overfunded it done extremely well so it's great yeah that's actually a big section on the on the website are, are about is about my projects and the mistakes and lessons learned that i've made by running my projects mm-hmm. on any you know i've run eight projects at this point i've raised over three million dollars but on every project i've made some key mistakes and i tried to learn from them and share those mistakes with others so so that you don't have to make the same mistakes that i did that's great and 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 so so let's talk about like for for the ink magazine uh, audience you know we're talking about entrepreneurs uh you know are there common misconceptions about uh crowdfunding that you want to sort of clear up or are there particular things that they should be thinking about when thinking about crowdfunding what are some of the highlights there that we want to make sure that they get across well, yeah, especially for the ink audience, um, of which I'm 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 a member. I, I think pricing is is can be a really interesting topic, mm-hmm. um, because e- even though crowdfunding, it, you're not really ordering a product. You're you're, and you're also not making a donation. It's kind of a hybrid somewhere in between there. You're making a <laughs> pledge. Um, I, I've seen a lot of interesting things happen with prices. Some creators can price their their. Uh, their rewards too low and then they because they haven't budgeted all that well and they might end up losing money based off of that more often i see rewards that are priced too high um and i think this is kind of a a a tricky level where it's not charity you're not asking for people to donate something to you you're trying to offer them something of value at at a price that's that's appealing to them um so finding that right price is really tricky um, I've written a little bit about it on the blog, uh, but it also just helps, like I said, to look at other projects to see how other projects have back, have, have priced their rewards. Mm-hmm. And, and tell me a little bit about sort of there's a lot of uh, the focus in your book and, and obviously in your blog is what you know best, which is board games and sort of physical product. Um, I love also, by the way, all the shipping challenges that you found and how to deal with the shipping. I mean, you've, you've dedicated a lot of great resource in your book about how to deal with international people buying the, your products. But what about subscription services or digital only products? One of the things that I didn't see as much in the book is that. What's your experience there in terms of how crowdfunding works with either subscription services or digital only, no physical product being produced? Well, I'm a big fan of a platform called Patreon. Okay. Patreon is uh, it's somewhat similar to Kickstarter and other crowdfunding sites, but it's specifically for people who create ongoing content. Mm-hmm. And so, whereas Kickstarter, like if I put a board game on Kickstarter, someone usually pays $30, $40, $50, and eventually they'll get a copy of the game. With Patreon, um, you usually sign up to make a small monthly contribution to the content creator. It's almost like a little tip saying, hey, I really like what you're doing, I'd love for you to keep doing it. Right. And Patreon can let you do can let you schedule that for once a month or every time the creator posts a new video or a new podcast or a new blog entry. 
um, the, the creator can, can decide how they want to schedule that. But I think Patreon is brilliant for, for creators who create ongoing content like that, specifically, especially uh, digital content. And, and is that is that one one time I- individually or is that actually subscription? Could somebody sign up for a monthly donation or a monthly subscription to that actual content? Yeah, the, the intent for it is is monthly. So I like I back a bunch of Patreon um, podcasts and, and video blogs and I usually give like a dollar a month to That's each great. of them or two dollars a month or five dollars a month if I, if I really, really love it. And so that's that's just an ongoing charge. Um, and Patreon charges my credit card once a month for like twenty dollars for all those projects wrapped together. That's great. And, and that that was one other question I was going to ask in terms of sort of like for smaller pieces, like for a dollar a month type of scenario. Um, you know, it, it, it's interesting to me because you then start getting into things like credit card fees, which can take a huge chunk out of the the, the producer's you know budget, right? So where where you were focusing on shipping costs around the globe and sort of how do you deal with that? I would assume that someone who's got more of a content based driven site or something that's basically using that they've got to deal with credit card transaction fees because if they're taking you know 20 30 cents out of each fee even a dollar a month doesn't go as far as it once did <laughs> yeah i think that's where patreon i don't know exactly how patreon does this but i think it's because patreon's able to lump together those charges um for per user like for me it's you know i have 15 different projects that i support on patreon but i'm charged 20 or 25 dollars a month right. total all at once that that fee is really minimized for the creators Great. on that cool. platform. Yeah, love that. So, so let's let's see any other any other sort of um, looking at sort of uh, from an entrepreneur's perspective. If I were if you were a first time crowdfunder, obviously read your blog, obviously read your book. Those are the first two things I would recommend to anyone. But in terms of like the types of projects that they might consider or things that are like you know, hey, I see this happen all the time, and avoid this particular pitfall. Give, give me some additional insights that we might be able to share with the audience here. Yeah, there, there's a lot. Um, I'll. <coughs> I'll mention one uh, one key thing that I think is about engaging your backers. So this is across any project level. Uh, if if you're purely going into it just to make a lot of money or try uh, with the hope of making a lot of money, um, I, I think maybe you might be missing the point a little bit of the of crowdfunding, which is the ability to engage to to know specifically who all of your customers are, who all of your supporters Great. are, these people who share your passion and your excitement for this thing you're trying to create. Um, and, and as a creator, I love being able to engage with each of those individuals. I know who all of my customers are on Kickstarter by name, by address. Um, awesome. And, and, uh, often that manifests during the project of a lot of conversations in the comments, just talking about the project, talking about what they love, our shared passion. Um, and so I guess the overall thing is, is that it's a big time commitment if you want to engage on that level. Mm-hmm. Uh, when I've run my campaigns, it's a full-time job for, a month leading up to the project, the month of the project, and the month after the project. You know, it's it's at least 40 hours a week, just focused on on the Kickstarter campaign. Um, so and, and that's yeah, one way to do it. I don't think everyone has to do it that way, but I've found success doing it that way. Sure. And yet one of the chapters in your book, which I really appreciate is don't quit your day job until you quit your day job, right? Which is basically <laughs> that you have to do all this stuff. If you're trying to, if you have sort of a day job that you like and you enjoy and you're sort of going down that path, you know, you yeah. want to also make sure that you're doing this, whether it's nights and weekends or specific hours or you're sort of taking days off or using vacation days, you want to be strategic about how you are launching your crowdfunding campaign so that you don't don't put your current job in jeopardy, but you also don't ignore or neglect your uh, your crowdfunding program. Yeah, a big part of it is time management. Um, another part of it is uh, not being uh, overwhelmed by the money. Uh, for example, when I funded my second board game project, it, ra- it was Euphoria. It raised over $300,000, which is a lot of money. That was way more than my current salary at the time. Yeah. But that money wasn't going to my salary. Right. That money was going to making a bunch of board games and shipping them around the world. And so I think sometimes you hear creators who uh, they, they successfully fund and they say, and the next day I quit my job. You know, I had this beautiful successful project, so I quit my job. And that is not the day to quit your job because you haven't delivered anything yet. Right. The day to quit your job is after you deliver and you still have a lot of money in the bank if, right. if you're lucky enough to do that. And, and so, you got people yeah. coming back to you saying, when's the next one? Show me the next one. How, how many more are you going to do with these things? We love it. Keep going. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So a lot of those funds might go into the next project or the next product. Yeah. 
It's awesome. Well, Jamie, I want to thank you. Uh, the book is um, a crowdfunder strategy guide. It is by far the best one out there that I've read on on crowdfunding. And and by I think it's you've just been very very generous with your time, with your knowledge, with your insights. Highly recommend that you you know if you're, this is something you're interested in, if you love uh, crowdfunding, then go pick up Jamie's book and and you'll be blown away with just how the wealth of information that Jamie's documented on your behalf. Well, thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much. You too. Take care.